I'm the oldest of four kids. And, um, you know, life growing up with, in our family was just about as normal as everybody else's family. Grew up in a nice Protestant home. Nothing was unusual, abnormal. Uh, my parents didn't, were not aware of any psychic abilities that they had when they were young. When I was a little girl, um, I was always very sensitive, uh, I think overly sensitive, and um, it affected it affected my life a lot. It affected uh, me physically. I had a lot of health problems when I was little. It was like I would come home from school and I would go into my room and I would create a little classroom. I would set all my dolls up and I'd set up my chalkboard and uh, <clears throat> I could I would do exactly as my teacher did that day. Um, and I would teach my dolls. I was always most comfortable when I was just by myself. I felt better physically, mentally. I could handle things better if I was by myself. But I found when I was, um, even with my whole family or in school, um, it seemed like there was always so much coming at me that it was hard to uh, deal with everything and I think that's why I had a lot of health problems as a child. Uh, something else that was kind of silly but um, back then uh, people would make fun of my name and um, there was a song back then, Little Sir Echo, and my teacher used to have me stand behind the piano and the class would sing Little Sir Echo How Do You Do and they in the song they say hello and then the person behind the, uh, the stage answers back hello and I used to just die when uh, I had to play the part of uh, Little Sir Echo behind the piano or behind the wall because I didn't want the attention. I didn't want to be focused on. Um, like I said, I was very shy. And, uh, and back then, I would have given anything if my name was just Susie or Barbie or Kathy, but not Echo. It was too hard for me. As far back as I can remember, I think age five, around age five it probably started, there was a male voice that would come and talk to me. And um, he would just say things to me like, um, everything's going to be okay. If, there was, if I was in a situation where I was feeling afraid, like at work or I mean, at work, at school or at home, um, the voice would just appear. I mean, not appear physically, but out of nowhere, the voice would say, everything's going to be okay. The voice also used to tell me all the time to go to Sunday school and learn everything that I could about Jesus. And um, I didn't know why, but I would go. Whatever this voice was, and I, as a... Uh, five-year-old as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, I used to think that this voice was God's voice. I just had no doubt in my mind that this was God talking to me. The voice used to say to me, uh, Jesus is your older brother, and he came to show you how to live your life. Okay, and um, I'd go off to Sunday school, and I always felt really ripped off when there would be a different lesson that day than talking about Jesus, because that's all I cared about when I went to church was hearing about Jesus. The voice also used to tell me, um, if a situation happened that was uh, emotionally painful, the voice would say, pay attention to this. Or it would say, remember this for when you grow up. Um, sometimes the voice would say, you will use this knowledge later on in your life. And I would hear that when I was seven years old. When I was 17 years old, uh, we were all sitting around the dinner table one night, and my brother, uh, who was 14 at the time, he was just learning how to play the drums. My parents had bought him a drum set. Every night after dinner, he would go downstairs to play the drums. And he always sounded terrible. And this one particular night, uh, he went downstairs, was clanking away at the drums, and all of a sudden, this really nice drumming music came from the basement. And we all looked at my dad as if he would know what was going on. And, and he said, I don't know, it must be the record that I had just bought him. My brother uh, was hysterical. He came flying up the stairs and said, um, did you hear it, did you hear it? And, uh, and we were like, yeah, what was it? He couldn't even talk, he was so upset. And he, then he said, there was a white figure 
that floated through the door and floated up to him and it had hands and it just, the hands came down on top of his hands and he said that his hands then played this really nice drumming music. And so we're just like, what? And he was like, no, it, no lie, it just happened and it was this white thing and he said, I closed my eyes really tight but I could still see it anyway. Mom was in a prayer group at that time and she said that there was a woman in her prayer group who knew of a medium from England that was living in St. Paul. And she said, I will call Julia and find out what to do and maybe get the number of that medium. My mom called the psychic, the medium, and um, uh, the psychic said to her, uh, yes, Mrs. Bodine, um, I've been expecting your phone call. She said, what just happened was that your son just met his guardian angel, and his name is Dr. Fitzgerald. And she said when he was living on Earth, he was a drummer, and um, that he is going to teach your son how to play the drums. <laughs> and uh, she said to Mom, you have some very gifted children, and I'd like to see each one of them for a psychic reading. It, we were absolutely absolutely freaked out that night. I don't think I slept with my lights on. I mean, I, no, I, I did sleep with my lights on um, because I was so afraid of, well, what if my guardian angel appears to me? And well, what did this lady mean that we're all gifted? What, what does all this mean? Like I said, I was 17 years old. I was very shy. Um, you know, I couldn't imagine what she was going to tell me. And uh, I remember talking to mom on the way over about, well, um, you know, what's going to happen? What is, she, what, what is this all about? And mom's saying, you know, maybe you, should think, maybe you should think of some questions. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. So I thought, okay, well, I'll ask her when I'm going to meet Mr. Wright and how many children I'm going uh, to have. I was, in my mind, I was imagining this, this psychic with, uh, oh, I don't know, big dangly earrings and uh, um, shawl and, and black cats. And in my mind, it, it was going to be really a, a spooky experience and instead this very sweet round petite woman from England opened the door and invited us in and uh, introduced us to her very normal looking husband and the house looked normal everything seemed so normal and um, and then she brought me into her reading room and uh, began to tell me that the information that she was getting was coming from my spirit guides and uh, she said that they were helpers from the other side. And um, she said that she had some important information for me. And um, she said that I was born with psychic abilities, with clairvoyance, which is the gift of seeing visions or images or pictures, clairaudience, which is the gift of uh, hearing. And uh, she said I was born with a gift of healing. And I'm looking at her, and I'm thinking, this woman is absolutely crazy. Um, this is not, none of this was in my reality. None of this. And I, I told her, I said, you know, I don't want any of this weird stuff. I just want to have a nice, normal life. And she said, no, you didn't come here this lifetime to have a nice, normal life. She said, you came to be a teacher and a healer. Then she said to me, your father is at home with a migraine headache. She said, you go home, and she said, take a couple of your father's hankies and put them on his head and she said lay your hands on top of his head and ask God to work through you to heal your father's headache. When I got home that night I um, told my dad what, this, what the medium had said. What was interesting was my dad as far as I had ever known my dad had never had a migraine headache before and that day he came home from work with a migraine headache. It was almost like it was all set up to happen this way and um, I just said, Dad, uh, she said, I was born with the gift of healing. Can I channel, can I try this? And he said, yeah, I'll just don't hurt my head. And um, so I got out the hankies and I placed them on his head and I put my hands on his head. And after about maybe 10 seconds, my hands started to heat up like little heating pads. And then they started to tremble. And I, I would hold them really stiff to try to make them stop. And um, as soon as I'd relax them again, they'd start to tremble again. And I could actually feel 
that it wasn't me, it wasn't, it wasn't just the heat from my body. There was actually a, a feeling of an energy that came into me and was channeling through me. And after about, I don't know, it may have only been a minute or two, it seemed like a long time, uh, my hands stopped. It cooled off and I took my hands off and my dad said, well, I'll be darned if my headache isn't gone. I thought, what does this mean? What, what do you mean your headache is gone? You know, what? And I had a million questions for my mom. You know, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, um, why, 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 why me? Okay, that was the big question. Why me? I wasn't religious. Um, I mean, yeah, I went to church like everybody else, but I didn't see myself as being any different than anyone else. So uh, it, was a, it was a very troubling experience for me, to say the least. Another psychic in town uh, named Bertie Torgerson called. We had never met her. She was a spiritualist minister. She called and said that we, uh, that her spirit guides gave her the name of eight people in the Twin Cities and told her that she was supposed to teach these eight people how to develop their psychic abilities. My name and my mom's name was on this list. And so Bertie said, I'm going to begin teaching classes in a week and um, I'd like to see you there. Mom came in and told me that uh, this woman had just called and and I remember saying, Mom, I don't, I, this stuff is just freaking me out, you know. Let's just go back to the old way of life before all this happened. And, um, but by the time that Thursday rolled around, we were really curious. And so we thought, okay, we'll just go one, one week and um, uh, that's all. We won't go back. Well, as it turned out, we went every week for, I'd say, on and off for about two years and learned to develop our abilities, learned... A lot, a lot um, about spirits, about heaven, oh gosh, uh, reincarnation, astral projection, uh, and how to develop our psychic abilities. I was always on edge about the whole other world out there and about my psychic abilities. Sam, give us an update on dreams. <laughs> May 1st, I had a dream. A big dust cloud descending on Texas. A lot of destruction. That happened last week. Big tornado was wiped out here in Texas. <laughs> but you know what's such a drag for you, Sam, is that you have these dreams and there isn't anything that you can do about no, it. No, there isn't. I mean, yeah. I mean, I could, I don't want to spend all the time here, but I could go into detail. I have a quick question. Yep. Um, I feel like since I started this class in my life, I've been chasing my life down the street trying to catch up. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's normal, if it's normal for just one really hard thing to be thrown at you after another, if it's necessary to throw it, or to slow it down, or if you should just go with it while it's happening. I think the best thing to do is really go with it and just keep listening to your intuition because, you know, I think that in the last and few weeks... I just, in the dream, I was just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And I woke up just kind of stunned. I didn't feel really upset, but I felt kind of drained mm -hmm. <laughs> emotionally. Mm -hmm. But um, then I realized that it was... I got to do the things that I didn't get to do with her. Mm -hmm. She looked totally different. She did, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. than when I knew her. Mm -hmm. It's a trip, you know? And then there's going to be days where you're going to say to your guides or to whoever, okay, I don't, I, I'm overwhelmed with life on earth right now with this dimension. I don't want any input. I can't, don't, don't be talking to me today, all right? And you can just shut it down and then just focus on this dimension. But then there's other days where you'll say, yeah, okay, I can handle it all today. And you'll be open on, on all the different levels. Does this tire you out? Because I'm uh, exhausted. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm afraid to say it. No, say it. Where else can you say it? <laughs> <laughs> you are. You are going to another level. I am high <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, and I always think 
the first night of class, I wonder if I should warn them, you know, uh, of how much their life is going to change in the next 16 weeks. No, maybe I better not, you know, because you never know for sure. But that is one thing that I hear from at least students in my classes is, oh man, has my life changed, you know? And uh, I've seen people get out of marriages. Um, I've I've seen, oh man, people leave jobs that they've been in forever. You know, I, it, it's just like they keep going along the spiritual path, they keep growing spiritually, and they just can't stay where they were stuck. They, it's like they get unstuck and they just have to stay in that forward movement. So I think it's good that you um, keep moving. I, I think it's also really important that you listen to your intuition rather than your head and not get caught up in what your head says you should be doing, but really go inside and find that voice and, and ask it for guidance. That's mainly what we're doing all the time, is healing our soul. Mm -hmm. That's really what our purpose is here, is to heal our souls and advance our souls. Yeah. Like you said, you know, like I think I said to you guys, um, you're developing your psychic abilities, there's spirits all over that can see that, and they're going to be like, oh, cool, there's somebody we can talk to, so. Yeah. <laughs> Students, uh, mother made this cake for class. It's incredible. And then give it to me. Okay. Oh. Ah! <laughs> 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 Ooh, it's a little warm here. Okay. Right here, Sam. He won't do it. Why? You know, right. I thought it was for the timer thing. It's for the flash. Save the flashlight on. When the light goes on, then. Okay, we're ready. Save Atlantis. Save Atlantis. Save Atlantis. <laughs> I would say from the time that I started learning from Bertie until the time that I actually uh, began doing psychic readings and spiritual healings full time as a living, it took about 12 years. There was this whole period of time before I decided to do this full time as a profession where I made a decision, okay, I'm just going to have a normal life. I'm going to have a normal job, and I, in spite of what that psychic said, I'm going to have the kind of life I want to have. So um, I was a secretary for a while, I was a chemical dependency counselor for a while, um, and I was also a barber for a while. Um, but no matter what I did, and no matter how stubborn I got about this, my psychic abilities just wouldn't go away. As a matter of fact, they would just <clears throat> continue to get stronger on their own. Um, I would be in the grocery store and my hands would just suddenly heat up. And um, I learned from my teacher that what that meant was that there was someone around me that was sick and needed some healing energy. My teacher had told all of us that we had spirit guides and I, I you know, the whole idea kind of creeped me out, like, oh my God, you mean there's spirits that follow me around all day and they see everything I do and they know my thoughts? And um, I didn't really understand, you know, why I even needed these spirit guides, especially if I couldn't see them. Um, but I remember asking her, well, how do I get to know these guys? I mean, how, how do you really know they exist? And she said, just tell them that you want to know them. You want to get to know them. You want to know when they're around. Uh, you want to know their name. She said, have an ongoing conversation with them. And so what I would do when I would get in my car is um, I'd be driving and I'd just say, well, I don't know if you guys are here, but if you're here, and I'd ask them questions and, you know, nothing would come. But um, I just kept up these conversations with midair. And then one day I was in the kitchen washing dishes and a voice said to me, my name is Theodore, but you can call me Teddy. And then another voice said, my name is Anna. And I just stood there just frozen. I was scared to turn around because I thought, oh my God, what if they're right there? And, uh, but I slowly turned around and there wasn't anybody there. And I was very relieved. Um, but I said, well, talk to me some more. And then I didn't hear from them again for, I don't know, uh, it could have been even a few months before again I heard another voice. 
You know, to tell you the truth, I don't remember the very first time that I saw my guides. I just remember thinking how normal they looked and how unspooky they were. I thought they were going to be real spooky looking. But they were just like um, folks, just regular folks. Uh, there were a, a couple of occasions where I would be out to on a date with somebody and uh, uh, my spirit guides who, um, who I was getting more and more comfortable listening to and hearing, they would say things like, watch out for him, he's married, or um, he's got another girlfriend, or, you know, they would just tell me little things. It would show up in, I remember one time being with a girlfriend in a restaurant. She didn't know anything about my psychic abilities, and um, I was standing, we were at a cafeteria, we were standing in line, she's talking to me, and suddenly I see her spirit guide standing behind her, and he says, you've got to tell her some things. And I'm looking at this guide, and I'm thinking, forget it, I'm, no! And so I'm just trying to have this normal conversation with her, and I'm seeing her face, but I'm seeing the spirit guide standing behind her, and he says to me, you have to tell her these things. And so we went and we sat down, and again, I'm just trying to eat my dinner, trying to have a nice, normal, everyday, mainstream kind of conversation. You know, how's your job? How's your job? Um, and again, her guide is standing behind her saying, you have got to tell her these things. So um, I, th I thought, okay, all right, all right. And I said to her, I need to tell you something really fast, and um, I'm sorry to do this to you, but... I have psychic abilities, and sometimes I can see people's spirit guides. And you have a, a spirit guide, and he wants me to tell you some things. And I couldn't even look at her. I was, I was just so embarrassed. Uh, I felt real apologetic for the way that I was. And, uh, and I told her everything that he said. And uh, afterwards, she started to cry. And she said, you know, just this morning I was talking to God, and I asked him about everything that you just gave me an answer to. And she said, but... I got to tell you, you scare the absolute hell out of me. And I said, I'm really sorry, you know. And, uh, and I noticed after that, we did not socialize anymore after that. So those kind of things would happen. And, um, and, I, and I kept seeing that uh, people, people would either go away or um, they would be very nervous around me. And so um, I, I also became aware of, of how isolated I felt a lot of the time because of the psychic and healing gifts. I was in college, I was 19 years old. I was gonna be, um, I was in college to be a social worker and um, um, I was engaged to uh, my boyfriend at the time. We were gonna get married and um, couple years I guess I, I don't know if I don't think we ever really established when but um, again I was determined that I was going to have the kind of life I wanted to have and so uh, I was in college I was going to marry this guy we were going to have lots of kids and uh, um, but I found out that I was pregnant and when I remember the day that the doctor told me that I was pregnant um, and I told my parents, um, everyone was really upset. Um, I told my baby's father, uh, he was upset. And it was like I was watching people plan my life. My parents were saying, well, this is what we should do, and this is the best thing. And my baby's father was saying, well, this is what we should do, this is the best thing. But again, that male voice appeared to me, or came to me um, and said that I needed to carry the child and place him for adoption. And this was all within that same day of finding out that I was pregnant. And um, I remember thinking, you know, um, no, I, I can't place a child for adoption. Are you crazy? No, we'll, we'll just get married and, and we'll keep the baby. And, um, and again, the voice inside said, no, you will carry this child and you will place him for adoption. I could see psychically, I could see inside my stomach, even though I was only three months along, maybe two months along, 
and I could see that it was a little boy. I could see that he had dark hair. Um, I, I would get psychic images of him living with another family. Uh, I would have images of his family, uh, his mother, dark hair, his father, light hair. But there's this whole other reality for me that goes on all the time. And this reality was there all the time throughout my pregnancy. What I did was I, um, I, went, I moved to California. We decided not to get married. I moved to California and um, um, placed my son for adoption. Throughout my pregnancy, I felt extremely connected to my baby. Now maybe this is how all women feel, I don't know. But I always felt deeply connected to the child inside of me. And I would talk to him all the time. I would just look inside of my stomach and I would see this little baby in there with this dark hair. And um, I used to take cocoa butter and I'd rub it on my stomach and I would say, I'm gonna tell you a story. And, um, and I would just rub my stomach as if rubbing the baby, and I would say um, that that I I couldn't raise him because it wasn't what I came here to do this lifetime. Um, that he would have another mom and another dad, but that someday we would come back together again. And I would tell him that I loved him very, very much, and that he was a very special baby, and that these people would be very happy with him. Um, and I used to say to him, you know, I'd tell him the story and I'd say to him, can you hear me? And he'd always, every time I'd say that to him, he would kick out and, you know, maybe it was just a coincidence, but it always felt like he was acknowledging that, yes, I'm hearing what you're saying to me. He was born on November 20th and uh, he had a full head of dark hair. Um, it was exactly what, he, what I had always seen on the inside. And I flew back to Minnesota, and that began a very um, difficult period for me in my life, where um, um, I suffered uh, from a lot of depression, um, got into uh, drinking very heavily, became an alcoholic, um, pretty much tried to just drown all that pain. Um, uh, in the alcohol and later got into a, uh, I was in a car accident and um, uh, so I was, I got a lot of uh, different prescription drugs for the pain that I was in and so I was mixing uh, alcohol and pain pills, you know, every day <clears throat> until um, age 24 when I hit bottom and um, I joined a recovery program for alcoholics. During this dark period, um, <clears throat> I was really angry with God because I was thinking, okay, uh, why does life have to be so damn hard? Um, I'd given up my child. Uh, <laughs> I had these abilities which I didn't really like. I didn't really know what to do with them. Um, I was suffering with a lot of problems with depression. I was an alcoholic. You know, it's like, wh why? Why does life have to be like this? It doesn't make sense to me. Why did it always have to seem so hard? And um, I was at a point with God where I really, I just, I just wanted to turn my back on Him and uh, everything. I didn't want to have anything to do with anything. My psychic abilities were, uh, I had a very difficult time with them when I, would, when I was uh, drunk or high on pills because then it was like, I, I, sometimes I couldn't even distinguish between the two different worlds. Which, which world was I living in? What was my reality? I didn't know. It was a very difficult time. And, um, and yet, as hard as it was, uh, and I'd never want to go through it again, I, today I'm very grateful for that period of time because um, I did get on the spiritual path as a result of joining the 12-step group and then my spirituality, my relationship with God started to develop and just took off. I mean, I just took to it like a duck takes to water and uh, it's like that was the thing I had been searching for my whole life was uh, spirituality, a relationship with God. One night uh, um, there was a knock at the door 
And this friend of mine from this recovery program was standing there and he had his eyes closed and he said, I've had a migraine headache for three days. And he said, I, I asked God to please help me. And a voice said, go to Echoes. And he said, I have no idea why I'm here. And I just stood there looking at him thinking, oh, no. And so I said to him, all right, I'll make you a deal. If you don't tell anybody that I was able to get rid of your headache, then I'll let you come in and I'll work on you and I'll get rid of your headache. If you promise not to tell anybody. And he said, yeah, I, I'll promise anything. I am in so much pain. And I said, okay, come on in. So he came in and laid down on my, heel, uh, or on my couch and I quick got a hanky and put it on his forehead and, and the heat came right away and channeled the energy to him. And I just said, and I was actually getting ready to go out and I said, okay, I, I, I've got to get ready to go out. So I said, you can just lay here for a few minutes. And um, I went in the bathroom and I was putting on my makeup. And about 10 minutes later, he came in and uh, he knocked on the bathroom door. And he said, uh, my headache is completely gone. I said, I know it works all the time. It's God, okay? Just promise you won't tell anybody. And he said, yeah, I promise. And he turned around and walked away. And I remember thinking that night, uh-oh, you know, is this stuff going to start happening again? And, um, and it, it did start happening after that, slowly, you know, one thing at a time, one experience at a time. So what I did was I would, uh, I graduated from barber school, I uh, started cutting hair um, in mainstream, and then I was doing psychic readings and healings in the evenings and on the weekends. And what was nice about it is that I felt like I was, I had some control. I could, can tell, I could tell the people who I wanted to know about my psychic abilities and the healing uh, gifts. And, um, and then the people that I didn't want to know, I didn't say anything to them about it. April of 1980, I made a decision to, um, actually, I, <laughs> I didn't want to make the decision, but I had been in a car accident um, several years before and had injured my upper arms. And so after cutting hair for four years, I couldn't keep, keep cut, keeping my arms up and cutting hair. And my spirit guides almost every day were saying to me, you have to quit this job. You know what you're supposed to be doing. And I'd say, just go away, leave me alone. And I just kept cutting hair and I kept going to the doctor and taking different things for my arms and my neck. And um, finally, uh, in uh, March of that year, uh, all three of my doctors said, you have to find a different career. You can't, you just can't cut hair anymore. Uh, didn't have any money saved or anything. And I just said, okay. I gave a month's notice at the barber shop. Um, and then the next part that was so scary for me was kind of coming out of the closet and then having to tell everybody, well, when people said, well, what are you going to do? Then I had to tell people, well, I've got psychic abilities and the gift of healing and I'm going to be doing this full time as a living. Um, I quit. I was done barbering at the end of May and um, June, July, August, September, um, October, Oh, were very stressful months. Um, the readings just kind of trickled in. I went from making a very good salary as a barber down to uh, uh, barely making any money. I, I remember one month making a total of $161 that month. Um, had to sell all my furniture, moved out of my very nice apartment into a, a furnished studio apartment downtown. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was a really hard time. And again, I was thinking, you know, God, uh, this makes no sense to me. Um, why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to give everything up uh, or actually lose everything? And one day I said to God, it was at the end of October, I said to God, okay, here's the deal. You got 24 hours, and if something doesn't happen in the next 24 hours, then I'm going back to cutting hair. I don't care how bad it is for my body. I don't care how much pain I live in. I'm not doing this anymore. I can't live like this. And the next day, the Star and Tribune called and uh, said that they were doing a uh, story on psychics for Halloween. And they were going to interview several psychics throughout the Twin Cities area, and they had heard of my name. 
And um, so we started talking on the phone. And I think, I bet you we talked for over an hour on the telephone. And she said to me, would you care if I came out to your house tomorrow and finished this interview and brought along a photographer? And uh, I said, no, I don't care. And I was just so blown away that the Star and Tribune had called. It just blew my mind. It was like, wow, you know, talk about, I gave him 24 hours and she called. Well, then two days later, the story came out. And my, my face, a picture of my face was on the cover of the variety section this big with, uh, you know, a, a, an article that had to be this big. And then that was even a huge, a long article on the inside of the paper. And my career absolutely took off after that. Absolutely took off. I got calls from all over the country, including Alaska. Um, I never even knew that our papers went out to other states, but I guess they go all over the place. And uh, everybody called me and wanted readings. And I was suddenly booked for six months in advance and uh, healings, readings, whatever. It just took off. He said that he had heard through the grapevine that I had psychic abilities, and he said, would you come over and <clears throat> check out our attic because we keep hearing really weird noises. We got a call from a family in South Minneapolis who, we got a call from a family in Crystal, Minnesota who said that they <sighs> heard a ghost singing opera. Something was and knocking everything. things off of her bookshelves, off of her dresser, knocking clothes out of her closet and um, she could feel something sitting down on her bed at night when she would go to sleep. Ghosts are very simply the soul of, of a deceased person who has chosen not to go on to the other side for one reason or another. They look exactly like people. They're not these globby blobs that we see in the movie. They're just, they look exactly like people except that they're transparent. And that's what they are. They are made up of energy. It's very simple. There's many different reasons why a ghost chooses to stay on this side. Um, the reasons that we have found is that are most common are uh, they're afraid that uh, if they go on to the other side and come face to face with God, God will send them to hell for things that they did bad in their life. That's the most common reason that we found. The other most common reason, when we ask a ghost, why are you here? They will say, because I don't want to see so-and-so. Um, either a, a deceased husband, a deceased ex-wife, a sister, parents, somebody that they didn't like died and before they did. And so when they die, they're just like, no, I'm not going over there. I'm not going to go deal with Aunt Sophie or whoever. I'm just going to stay here. The problem with ghosts is that they can actually breathe in fear that people are feeling. Fear is, gives off an energy. The first time that... Um, I was ever called on a, I don't know what you'd call it, a, I guess a ghost busting job. We didn't call it one, that back then. But a friend of my mother's called and said that um, uh, she wanted to know if we would come over and check out her attic because she said that there were some strange noises going on upstairs. And also that her son, who was a recovering alcoholic, was having a really hard time staying sober. And she said that his personality would change drastically, and they didn't really know why. So she just asked, you know, would we come over and check it out? So when we got to her friend's house, um, we went upstairs to the attic. And, and to tell you the truth, we were scared to death. We really didn't know what to expect when we got upstairs. And when we did get up there, there was actually a family of four transparent people. I mean, they looked just like people except that they were see-through. And we just looked at them, and, uh, and I looked at my mom, 
and said, can you see those people? And she said, yeah. And, uh, and then the woman, female spirit, started talking to us, communicating to us through thought. And she told us that, that um, her husband was an alcoholic when he was living and um, also smoked cigarettes. And she said that one night he passed out, their house burned down, they all died in a fire, and that he would not let them go on to the other side because um, he was afraid that God would send him to hell for killing his family. So she said, so we just came here and have been living in this house and he won't let us go on to the other side. And then the other thing that my mom picked up psychically, she got psychic information that this man's uh, soul or spirit would enter the son of her girlfriend from time to time um, so that he could get high. And, um, and they said the spirits, the spirit guides gave us this information and said that's why he was having such a hard time staying sober because this male spirit or ghost would actually go inside of his body and, um, and then the kid would get the real strong cravings for alcohol and then he'd go off the wagon and start drinking again. So we didn't know what to do with them. We just looked at these four spirits and said, well, you have to leave because she doesn't want you here. You're scaring her. And um, so they did disappear, but for all we know, they, you know, either went out the window or went over to the neighbor's house. We really didn't, we didn't do anything to <clears throat> uh, assist them to the other side or anything. We just said, you have to leave, and, and they did. They disappeared. I got a phone call from a woman who uh, lived in St. Paul, West St. Paul, who had, it sounded like a very haunted house, and I, I was scared to go on this job. So I asked my brother Michael, who was seeing spirits and was doing psychic readings at that time, if he would go with me on this job. And it was great. We went on the job together. Um, it, it worked out really well. We were able to help each other. It made the job go a lot easier. and. Um, and after that job, word just seemed to travel throughout the community that if somebody had a spirit, they would give us a call. And that's how we got going on this whole ghost brother, brother sister ghost busting team was just simply word of mouth, and uh, it took off. And so we had never heard of this ever. Um, something singing opera. Okay, we had to see this. The ghost would or she said something would pull her ponytail. And uh, she said, I'm to the point now where I won't come home from school until mom gets home from work. We went down to the uh, master bedroom and there in the master bedroom was this spirit, this female spirit standing there. She was about, uh, she looked about mm, 60, 65 years old, kind of heavy set and um, asked her what her name was and I believe she said it was Grace. And we just said, okay, Grace, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm the nanny for five different homes in the neighborhood. And she said, um, I just go from house to house taking care of these families. That's my job. And we said, OK, do you sing? And she said, yes, that she sang opera. She said she loved opera. And, um, and then Michael asked her, uh, or I asked her, I don't even remember, OK, what about the uh, ponytail? And she said that she said that she would pull the teenager's ponytail when the daughter would be disrespectful to her mother. And she said, I'm sorry, but that's just not the way teenagers are supposed to be with their mothers. And, and then one of our guides suggested to us, they said, tell her that she can help, she can be a nanny to the families on the other side. And so that's what we did. We said, you know, there's a lot of families on the other side that could probably use a very good nanny. And um, you know, you need to go and be with other souls just like yourself who can see you so that you can communicate with them, they can communicate with you. And um, we, we just said to her, you know, we always have to stay really firm, but we said, you just cannot stay here. You have to go to the other side. And um, so after about a half an hour, it usually takes a while to convince them that this is what they need to do because they usually don't want to do it. Um, she said, okay, that she would leave. And she did, you know, we did see her go through the tunnel and she went into the other side and she was gone and we called the family about a week later and asked if they were having any problems and they said nope everything had stopped and then 
we started to walk up the stairs um, and oh god it just felt terrible it was so creepy uh, it was a feeling like we were being watched and we were being watched by someone very angry because they have this this almost morose kind of heavy feeling and um, I went back downstairs it was fine with me I just uh, for some reason this guy just gave me the creeps and so I went down and I stood down at the bottom of the stairs and uh, and my brother started talking to him and just said you know what is your name and he said Roy then what was interesting was that the hallway started to fill up with this gray energy it was like it was coming off of this Roy and when I looked up the stairs, it was an absolute haze. I couldn't even see my brother standing up at the top of the stairs. And I said, uh, Michael, are you still there? And he goes, yes, yeah, sis, but some weird stuff is going on up here. Michael uh, looked at his guides and said, okay, give me some suggestions here because this guy is being totally obnoxious about leaving. And they said, ask him about his dog named Copper. So Michael said to him, um, uh, Roy, did you have a dog named Copper? And Roy suddenly, I mean, his whole energy changed and he got really soft and said, well, yeah, I, yeah, I had a dog named Copper. And um, Michael said, well, we're bringing Copper here so that you can see him and right then Copper came bouncing into the room and he um, comes right up to this Roy and Roy got down on his knees and he was going oh Copper Copper and they started you know just like the dogs licking him in the face and he's all happy to see his dog and he's petting him and um, and Michael said okay now Roy here's the problem Copper lives on the other side and if you want to be with Copper, you need to go with him to the other side because it isn't fair for Copper to keep him stuck here on Earth. And um, so Roy kind of hemmed and hawed and paced back and forth for a little bit and then said, yeah, okay, I'll go. And he did go. And he and Copper both went off together. And we have the ability to see the tunnel and to see the light that they go into, which is the entrance into the other side. So uh, we just guided them just kept saying okay Roy just keep moving down the tunnel come on keep going and then he did go into the light with copper and uh, you know we always tell our clients when we leave if you have any problems give us a call and we never heard from them again so we assumed everything was fine that was really a cool thing to see how that um, animal's spirit when he came into the room he was just so alive and he was so happy to see Roy and it was really cool to see Roy's whole demeanor completely change so it worked out really well. There was a male spirit that slowly started to appear to me and um, he was very angry and I said to him, you know, what's, what's the deal here? Um, who are you? And he said his name was Kenneth. And I said, well, um, okay, um, Kenneth, why are you here in this woman's house? And he said, uh, no, uh, I'm not in her house, she's in my house. And he said, um, that he hated her and he said he went off to Vietnam he came back from Nam and he said and all these people are living in my house and he had on a uniform but he had a big hole right here it looked like a, a like a cannon or something shot right through him sometimes people are taught that there's no such thing as life after death so when their soul comes up out of their body at the time of death the soul doesn't know where to go and the soul thinks, okay, there is no such thing as life after death, so I must not be dead. Um, and so it'll just go find a place to stay or it'll go in a home that it previous li previously lived in. So I just said, Ken, what is the last memory that you have? And he said, Vietnam. And I said, okay, look down at yourself. Look at your clothes. And he looked down and I said, I think you were killed in Vietnam. He just started yelling at me about, no, I'm not dead, and you're just like her, and I want you out of my house, and I want you all to leave me alone. Just get out of here. Just leave me alone. And I said, okay, well, the point is they can't see you, and that's why they're not talking to you. You are deceased. You need to move on to the other side. And he got very emotional and started crying, and he was very depressed. Um, and I just said, Ken, you know, I sat down with him on, and 
uh, I sat down on the bed and he was, he was sitting on the bed. So we talked for at least 45 minutes and he did finally consent to going on to the other side and so I just talked him into the tunnel and over to the other side which is where he went. Uh, about two days later the woman's uh, roommate called me and said I just want you to know that she really missed Ken a lot. The, everything was quiet around here. Uh, we just had a normal life for the first time ever and it really bugged her and so she asked Ken if he would come back and uh, he said if she calls you and says that you know you didn't do a good job or whatever um, you did do a good job it's been really nice and quiet around here but he said Ken is back. I said okay but I never did hear from her again so Hi, nice I'm Echo you. Bodine. Nice to meet you. Thank Very you. Nice to meet you. Some people here who are interested in Great, this. great. This is my friend Joni. Hi, Hi Joni. My sister Liz. Hi, Liz. And Joni's friend Libby. Hi, Libby. Hi. It's nice to meet you Thank all. You too. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, what I need you to do is tell me what symptoms that you're having that makes you think that you have a ghost in the house. Okay, um, let's see. I've heard voices. I've okay. heard a woman's voice mainly. Okay. And knockings in the walls. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen lights at night. Okay. And there's a part of the house over here that we walk through mm -hmm. that everybody kind of gets the creeps. Your skin is kind of raised when you walk through there. All right. Have you ever seen a ghost in here? Well, <clears throat> I saw something. I saw a man in the corner of the room. Okay. Um, but I don't think it's, I mean, I know it's not the old guy who used to live here okay. that I kind of assumed is responsible for the other things that we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a man who didn't look like, he didn't, I didn't get the feeling he wanted to hurt me or anything. Okay. In fact, he seemed friendly. All right. But I'm just a little curious, you know, to know mm -hmm. who that is and if they're still here and what it is. Well, okay, what I would like to do <clears throat> is I would like to just walk through the house by myself and um, <clears throat> the reason I do that is so that I'm not influenced by any of your vibes or any, any other person's, living person's vibes around me. Okay. And, <clears throat> um, and I just look into each room. I usually keep the lights off because ghosts are easier to see in the dark and so I keep the lights off, just walk through. And once I find a ghost, um, what I usually do is just walk over to it, ask them what their name is and why they're here. And then once I've gone through the whole house, then I'll come back and I'll tell you everything that I find. Oh, cool. Okay, and then at that point, I'll, I'll ask you if you want me to get rid of the ghosts or if you want to keep them. You know, it'll be completely up to you. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Great. great. Okay. Um, hmm. Mm. Whoa! Ha. Well, I just found one standing right here, right here. God. Okay. Mm. Oh man! All right, wait now. Ooh. that one walked right through me. I hate that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Oh God! Here we go. Too. Oh God, it's giving me the willies, I'll tell you that. Okay. Oh. Um, let's see. No, this room is clear. No, it's clear. Although, no, it's just vibes in here. Energy. <sighs> mm. 
Mmm. Yeah, there's one in here too, oh, man. <sighs> Ooh, I'm gonna try this room again because this one isn't very good. Tell you, I can hardly walk in here. Mmm. God dang, is this hard? Oh, this is this is um, a really strong force in here. All right, it's like it just doesn't even want me to come in this room. Wow, wow. See, that's as far as I can go. I can't go any further. What is up with you? Wow. Mm. Wow. Oh, man. All right. Attic, huh? Um, all right, I have to find some place where there isn't one so I can just... All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask my guides to help me here because this is... Um, Wow, there's a woman who used to live in this house who is who lives here now. Okay, so who are you? You used to live here, huh? Okay, why are you in the bathroom? You like this room? You're frightened? You're frightened of what? Me? The cameras, yeah. So, do you live here all the time? Yes. She says, yes, I do. Why don't you uh, go to the other side? I don't want to, she says. I like to live in my house. Oh, man. I get a name like... Um, like a Lily or Lilith or, or um, uh, that's all she did. That's all. What? That's what she gives me, Lily. Okay. Well, you know what? I need to uh, move out of here. Um, it's nice to meet you, and um, I'm gonna go over there. I don't really like the feeling over there, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know what it is, but I better go find out. Don't you think? Okay. All right. Well, I'll see you later. Okay. All right. Now, right at this point, what I'm trying to do is get up the courage to go in there because um, this is a strong, it's a strong, strong presence in there who does not want me in there. Um, wants me out of the house, wants me to leave everybody alone, wants me to leave him alone. Um, it is a male. What? What's... Uh... He says, don't come in any further. All right. Man, you have some strong vibes. What is the deal with you? He says, I don't want you coming into my home. I just want you to leave well enough alone. There's no reason for you to be here. He seems particularly attached to wh whosoever room this is. Almost like a... Almost like a... Like a, I don't know, um, I don't know, like almost an obsession with him to protect this person. See, I mean, he won't let me come past this wall. He's standing right there, right there is this male spirit. And he's telling me that's as, this is as, really as close as I can get. Okay, he says to me, these girls are young. 
They're inexperienced. They're naive. They need someone to watch out for them. He says, if they were my kids, I would have never let them leave home at such a young age. I would have kept them under my roof till they were at least 30. All right, then he says that this room is filled not just with his vibrations, but with many vibrations from the past. He says a lot, a lot went on in this room that people have no idea of. He says that's all I'm going to say to you about that. This is not a peaceful room at all. It's very unsettling in here for anyone that's sensitive. I don't even know how anybody can come in this room, let alone sleep in here. Um, they've probably just gotten used to it, but it's not a good feeling in here at all. Okay, so his name is Tom, says he's 26 years old, died in a car accident, doesn't want to go to the other side at all. There's a 26-year-old male named Tom standing by the front door. He says he was killed in a car accident and that he likes the people in this house, that's why he lives here. He says he doesn't want to go on the other side. He says he's not causing any problems. He says, I just want to be here, I really like the people here. He's just not ready to go to the other side. Okay, upstairs in the bathroom, there's an old woman, white hair, very, very old. She used to live here a long time ago, long, 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 long time ago. And um, she doesn't want to go to the other side. She feels safe here, but she'll only go in the bathroom. Um, she, now, right now, I don't know if it's the same ghost you saw, she had on a lavender dress with little white lace on it and she said her name was Lily or Lilith like a flower but that's what she said all right there's a man in the blue bedroom that will not let me go past um, won't let me go into the room as far as where the rug starts um, he says that this was his home. He says that if that the reason he's here is to protect the girls. He says that if he were your parents, um, he wouldn't that he he'd keep all the girls home until they were thirty because he says um, they're they're um, they're young and they're naive and they need protecting. And so he feels that his job is to be here to protect you. He he gives off a really um, cold, angry energy. Um, there is a male spirit standing over there watching us around the corner. He keeps popping his head around the corner to see what's going on around here. And the first name that comes to me with him is um, Joseph. He hangs out here because there's so many other spirits here. Oh, they all say that the old man is the one in charge. Okay, um, now I'm asking them if, oh, okay, they said that um, there was um, the young man that you knew from Peru in a past life, his soul is a friend of your souls, Petrus. Is his name? Ooh, mm, mm. And uh, he comes to visit also, from time to time. Um, he uh, has tried appearing to you many times, and. Um, Uh, the voice has, has succeeded three different times. Tries to make himself known to you in dreams. 
he has not reincarnated as you have. And so he comes to visit from time to time. All right, listen to me, Joseph. The best thing you could do for yourself would be to go to the other side. The reason you won't go to the other side is because you're afraid of what's going to be there. But there's nothing to fear. Same with Tom. He's afraid of what it's going to be like. Same with Maria. Now what would be nice, Joseph, what would be really, really nice is if you would just round them all up. But I'll tell you what would be a good deed, and that would be if you would go to the bathroom upstairs and get the old woman out of there. She needs assistance to the other side. You and Tom could do that. It would be a good deed. Did you have a grandma when you were living? Okay. Wouldn't it have been nice if someone would have helped her to the other side? If she got lost? Oh, listen to me. Okay, now, you see this Tom? Mm-hmm, he's a sweet young man. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, he said that he would take you over there. Mm. So... I want you to go with him, really. Okay? Please. I want you to go with Tom. Tom, just go take her by the arm like you would your grandma. All right, now, Joseph, Tom's going to take Lily over to the other side. I want you to go with them. What I want you to do is stay there for three days. And if you don't like it, you can come back. All right? All right, guys. You see that light? I want you to move toward the light. Just float down that tunnel. Lily has a sister that she was particularly close to. She'll be coming somewhere during the tunnel to help you. All right? Just keep going. Yeah, that's right. See, you're almost there. You're really doing, whoa, look at that. Here comes Lily's sister. See that? Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, jeez. Okay, guys, keep going. You're doing a great job. Whoa. Keep going, Tom. Yeah, that's... You're almost there. When you get up to that light, you just go right into it. Just dive into it like a pool, okay? I'm completely open psychically right now, which... That's why my body jerks like that. And I'm going to try to shut myself down a little bit so I can have a normal conversation. Oh, so I'll be with you in a second, Amy. Hmm. Hmm. No, just drink some water. So all we have left now is the guy upstairs, <laughs> who is a royal pain. Did you get a name on him? Wouldn't give me a name. Mm -mm. I think I even asked him. I think I'm sure I asked him. Wouldn't give me a name. I'm really surprised he's still here. Kind of, except your description of him kind of fits what people said about him when he was alive. Okay. Um, this is called sage. It's called crushed Dalmatian whole sage, and um, it just goes in 
and cleans out all old vibes in a room. That's right. Now we're getting it. That's right. All negative energy. Leave this room now. Leo, I want you to leave, please. I want you to go to the other side. Enough is enough. It's not your home anymore. Okay? Okay. Let's go to the other side, please. Go over to the other side with your relatives. The girls will take care of the house. There's nothing that you have to stick around for, okay? All right, good. This is clear, 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 clear. Okay, Tom is absolutely gone. See, you can't even feel him. Yes! I love it. <laughs> oh, yes. Did you see this sign? Great sign. I want that sign. We're done. The whole area of spiritual healing for me was very confusing because, um, you know, I had my psychic teacher, but uh, there wasn't anyone around to teach me about about uh, healing. I mainly just listened to my intuition, and uh, my guides would talk to me once in a while about different things. But in the, one of the, one of the things that I was so confused about all the time was that of all the the healings, you know that they talk about in the Bible, um, it seemed like every time Jesus laid his hands on someone, they were instantly healed. And I, for a long time, I wondered, why aren't people getting instantly healed when I'm channeling healing to them? And, you know, there was the obvious reason that I'm not Jesus Christ. But then I kept thinking, well, but if God's chosen me to work through me as a healer, then people should be getting instantly healed. And, um, and it was a a question that just bugged me all the time. Clients would come for healings and it would take, they'd have to come back several times to get healing. Some people would get healed, other people wouldn't get healed. And um, <clears throat> and I would ask God about it, but I never really got any clear answers. There was a man that came for a healing that had uh, asthma. And his asthma was so bad that, <sighs> that's how he sounded. <sighs> all the time when he was breathing and one time I had my hands on his lungs and I saw this image inside of his lungs of when he was three years old I saw a, a picture of an adult male with his uh, suitcases packed walking out the front door and he never came back and then I saw the words abandonment written across this man's chest so I mean psychically it wasn't real and so I said to him did, did a, a significant male leave your life when you were three years old? And he said, yeah, my dad walked out on us when, when I was three. And uh, I said, did he ever come back? No, never saw him again. And I said, how long after this experience happened did you get asthma? He said, a week later. And I said, okay, what it looks like is that you've got to deal with the emotional issues around your dad leaving. And he said, oh, that's a bunch of crap. He said, uh, um, that happened a long time ago. That doesn't affect my health. And I said, but your lungs just told me that story. That story is, is sitting in your lungs. And after that experience, I continued to be able to see inside of people's bodies. I, I kept seeing, okay, this is why people aren't getting instantly healed because they need to deal with those emotional issues and they don't want to. And it isn't because I, the psychic or the healer, is doing something wrong or that I'm inadequate as a channel for healing, but um, that they've got their issues too. And, um, and, and slowly, over many years, I, I learned a lot about the whole area of um, the gift of healing and people's resistance to being healed. Of all the things in my life, that I had been through, that was the one area 
that I, I could never get peaceful with. Like, why would a person have to give birth to a child and then give that child up? It never, I could never get peaceful with it. And I used to ask God to, um, you know, when, when my son turned 18, I said, can I, can I find him now? And a voice inside of me would say, not yet. All right. And I would go to other psychics and say, you know, am I going to meet my son someday? Oh, yeah, you'll meet him before he's 25 years old. Every psychic that I ever went to said that to me. Um, well, then he turned 20. Can I find him now? No, not yet. Well, it was really interesting. Uh, he had turned, he was 24 years old. And it was in June of 92. One morning I woke up and my inner voice said to me, you can start looking for your son now. And I said to God, okay, now remember, I placed him for adoption in California and the, the records are sealed and it's almost impossible. You gotta help me. And that day, a client came for a healing and when I asked her you know, what she wanted healing for, she said she needed a healing for her heart because she had been adopted and she had just met her biological parents and she said as, as happy as it was for her she realized that she had had a lot of trauma around being placed for adoption. So I said to her, how did you find them? Uh, and she said, well there's an agency that can get past all the birth records and um, or uh, that can get past all the sealed birth records and um, she said um, or I told her that I had a son and I said, you know, just this morning my intuition told me that I could start looking for him. And she said, well, when I'll go home, I'll, uh, I'll call you and I'll give you the name of the adoption or this agency. So she called me when she got home, gave it to me. I called the lady right away and she said, yeah, I'll send you all the forms to fill out. Well, what was interesting was that I had been having these visions for about three months of a man, a young man, um, tall. He looked real tall in these images and he had really long hair in the back. I also, the day that I had filled out these forms and sent them in, I kept getting an image of uh, Halloween, pumpkins and Halloween and, and thought, what, this is June. There's no way it's going to take till Halloween. The day before Halloween, she called me and she said, I found your baby. And um, she said, he's six foot two. He's got uh, brown hair, green eyes, and he lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. So the next day at 10 o'clock, I, um, I got up and I, and I called. I, was, I, was, I called, but then I'd hang up. I called three different times and hung up before anybody actually answered the phone. I was so scared. And um, so by the time I actually got called the house, it was 1020, and his girlfriend answered the phone and said, no, he just left. He went to the grocery store, but he'll be right back. And um, I said, okay. And um, I said, I'll call back in a half an hour. Well, I mean, it's a very long story, but um, uh, I did call in a half an hour later, and uh, we ended up having just an incredible conversation for about an hour on the phone. When um, I first told him that, I said, you know, um, uh, my name is Echo Bodine, and, and I believe that I'm your birth mother. He said, there was silence on the other end of the phone, and then his, his first words were, um, this is really my mom. And I said, uh, yeah, it is. And he said, uh, I've been waiting for this phone call all my life. What took you so long? And of course I started to cry and, and said, I, I don't know, uh, it, it all had to feel right. Well, what I later found out was that in June of that year, he had said to his girlfriend, they were going to go to a wedding out in California. And he said, when I go out to Cal when we go out to California this summer for that wedding, I'm going to start looking for my mom. So it was probably that very day or right w around that time when he had kind of opened the door that my guides came and said, okay, now you can start looking for him. And he came up to Minneapolis about a month later. We talked every day on the phone until he got here. And he was here in town. Um, we went to um, Garden of Eden. I had to get some oils. And uh, we came out of the store. We were walking down the street. And he looked over at me and said, you know what the best smell in the whole world is? And I said, no, what? And he said, 
cocoa butter. And I, I suddenly flashed back to California and said, why? And he said, I don't know. My whole life, I've just loved the smell of cocoa butter. And he said, uh, every year when the summer comes, I go and buy, buy a bottle of cocoa butter and I put it on the dash of my car. And he said, when I come out from work at the end of the day, it's all warm inside my car and it smells just like cocoa butter. And so then I told him the story of how I used to rub it on my stomach and tell him how special he was. And we, today, you know, it's been five years and we just have a wonderful relationship. So, I got my baby back. Dealing with spirits for the last, or I should say dealing with ghosts for the last 20 years has taught me a lot about dying, about death, about dying, about the dying process. And um, I have learned that before we come into a, each lifetime, we draw up the plans for that lifetime. Our soul works with, uh, they're called elders on the other side, to draw up the plans. And um, we have a whole itinerary when we come in, before we come into each lifetime. And also, um, we have written down, it's part of the plan, how we're going to die or, uh, well, what's written down is when we're going to die. We may not have the specifics down as far as how we're going to die, but um, the point is that before we're even born, our death has been um, decided. Um, and really what death is about is, you know, in our in our whole world, because we're all physical human beings, and, and I believe when God created our bodies, he put the strong desire to survive in our bodies. So when, when we physically die, a lot of us see death as a failure. The doctors failed, uh, the person failed, the, the spiritual healer failed, whoever was working on them, they failed. Um, or the person is being punished, or uh, God is taking that person home to be with him, um, this selfish God. It's, it's, it's really sad, our whole uh, belief about death, because according to the spirits and according to the souls that I've worked with, death is not any of those things. Death is graduation day. Death is uh, the ending of a time where the soul has come, come to earth to learn how to live, how to grow, um, how to expand its, its consciousness, uh, to grow spiritually, to work on emotional issues, to resolve relationships from the past. I mean, all of these things um, the soul has been very involved in for many, many years. And then when the soul is done, it simply leaves the physical body, which is death to us. And to us, we see it as a bad thing. But to the soul, it's, it's again, it's, it's like graduation day. It's, it's a release of all of this learning, uh, of the pain that went on. And the soul, usually, standard procedure, shall I say, is that a soul will come up out of the body at the time of death and will simply move on to the, to the white light. All of us, when we come out of our body at the time of death, can see that light. And we feel we're, we're naturally pulled to that light. It's just like a way to come, come home. You know, like animals, they say if you drive a cat two miles away from its house and drop it off in a field, it knows where to go. It knows how to go home. And that's how it is with our souls. We see that light, and we just know that's where I go to go home. Death is not... A failure. Death is not a punishment. Death is simply graduation day. I've been channeling spiritual healing for um, almost 32 years um, and at least 12 years full-time as a profession and in the last year, um, I've been finding myself getting more and more burned out on 
people's problems, on people's pain, um, on, on the fact that people don't want to have to look at their emotional issues. Um, they want to go to somebody else and get healed, but they, they don't want to do, and not everybody, this is just, you know, maybe half the people are really willing to work on themselves and the other half just want other people to fix it for them. And I, I found myself getting more and more um, just exhausted, just emotionally and physically exhausted from doing the healing work. Um, physically, my body started going through changes as a result of channeling the healing energy. Uh, my arms were again bothering me from channeling that kind of energy. My hands were feeling almost arthritic from um, working on uh, a lot of people. And in uh, the spring of this year, I made a decision with the help of my guides and my inner voice that it was time to take a break. When I first, when I first was getting the guidance in the spring that um, I needed to let it go, um, I had a hard time with it, and I and I went and talked to my spiritual advisor, um, Reverend Phil Laporte, who I just loved, and uh, said, you know, it feels like God's telling me it's okay to stop doing individual healings, um, and I don't know, I can't get peaceful about this, and he said to me. How many years did it take you to get peaceful with, with your abilities? And I said, about 20 years. And he said, so you've been working really hard for 20 years to accept that you have psychic abilities and that you are a channel for he spiritual healing. And he said, and now you're being told to walk away from all of it. He said, can you see why it would be so difficult? And he said, I think twice you're going to be approached by people that are very important to you and they're going to ask you to channel spiritual healing to them. And he said, you're going to have to say no to them. And he said, can you do that? And I said, wow. Um, well, uh, I guess I'll have to. Because I said, physically, I can't, I can't do it anymore. My arms hurt too much. I get too tired. Um, emotionally, I get too drained. I said, I'm going to have to learn to say no. And he said, that's going to be your biggest challenge because you're so used to saying yes to people. And two weeks to that day, he called me and said that he just found out that he had cancer. And an hour after hanging up from his phone call, my best friend called and said that she just got the results back from a biopsy that she had done and that she had breast cancer. It's been a, a tough, I guess, six months just as far as who am I now? What do I do? What is my what is my purpose here? And um, trying to shift gears and, and see myself more as a writer and as a teacher rather than um, an indiv individual healer that I've been for many, many years. I believe that my internal voice is the voice of God. My intuition is the voice of God. And um, so I'm always focused on that internal voice. Whenever I ask God for help or any kind of direction, I always listen in here, not out here, but in here. And when I say to God, what am I going to do? There's no answer. But I've been in this place before, and, um, and I've come to know that there's always an answer. It's just in a different time than when I would like it to be there. So something's coming, I know that. I know it's, it is very important to get these books done. Um, and they're just a whole lot more about what I've learned over the last 32 years on this journey. And um, it is important information to get out there. And once they're done, then I'm sure I'll be told, as I have for the last number of years, okay, now you need to go do this. And um, and I'm now at the place where whatever I'm told to do, I'll do it. You know, the fight is no longer there. I think, and I don't even know if that's the right word.